A lecture, like the one I'm going to give in Basel tomorrow morning, naturally has to be comprehensible on its own terms for everyone. But people connected with the Anthroposophic movement can have a more particular grasp of things. Today, therefore, assuming you have the necessary foundations already, I'd like to expound on certain matters that serve deepened insight into the sphere of truths that anthroposophy must speak to humanity. Let me recall again, firstly, that the forces at work in a human being are organized and oriented toward two poles. We best understand human nature, best develop a kind of human self-knowledge, if we take account of these two poles, that of the will and that of the intelligence. The human being is a being of will and a being of intelligence. For the period between birth and death, the element of sensibility and feeling lies between these two poles. This feeling element is the bridge connecting intelligence and will. As you also know, these forces can more or less separate when a person arrives at what one calls the threshold to the world of spirit. But what I wish to consider today, especially is the relationship we have as intelligent human beings to the surrounding world, on the one hand, to the world in general, and then the other relationship we have to the world by virtue of the fact that we are beings of will. Let us first reflect on the latter. You know that during our lifetime between birth and death, we develop willpower as the impulse-giving energy of our actions, of everything we do. In its enactments through the human organism, this willpower is naturally very complex. But the nature of will within us bears a certain similarity with particular forces of nature. In fact, the resemblance is sometimes so close as to be identical. And so we can speak of an intimate affinity of human will forces with nature forces. But you also know from previous lectures that we are in a kind of sleeping state as regards everything concerning our will, even when we are awake. In our conscious mind we possess ideas of what we intend, but how this actually comes about, that a particular thought is expressed in a willed action, is beyond our ken. We do not know what the connection is between the thought, quote, I will move my arm, close quote, and the whole process that leads to this actually happening. This occurs entirely within the subconscious, and we can say that the actual will process is no more conscious for us than what occurs when we are asleep. But in asking how the human will is connected with the surrounding world, we must immediately engage with something that appears really somewhat paradoxical to the consciousness of today as it has developed over the last three, four, or five centuries. People mostly think, as I have mentioned here in the past, that the earth would have evolved in the same way if there were no people upon it. A modern natural scientist will describe the earth's development in terms, say, of geology and physical processes. And even if he does not expressly state this, Underlying what he says is the view that from the beginning of the earth until its hypothetical end, everything would unfold in the same way without a human population. Why do people schooled in modern science think in this way? It is because they believe that if, for example, something occurs in the mineral or plant realm of the earth on 9 November 1919, it was caused by whatever occurred in the mineral realm prior to this date. People think like this. Here's the mineral kingdom, where mineral phenomena occur, and there's a drawing. 
and these phenomena are the effect of preceding causes. A mineral cause gives rise to a mineral effect. Well, that's how people think. You can see that they think like this if you open any book on geology. You'll find a description of the present state of the earth characterized as an effect of the Ice Age or some other preceding epoch. But as causes, such authors cite only occurrences or phenomena in the mineral kingdom itself, with no account taken of how human beings came to populate the earth. It is thought that even if the human being did not exist, everything apart from us would still have developed as it appears in external reality. But the human being has always also been present. You see, underlying this is something that does really point to the earth as a whole, a whole where nothing can occur in the earth's development without human beings also being among the active causes. Let me give you an example. As you all know, our present epoch, if we regard it as including everything that has happened since the great Atlantean catastrophe, was preceded by another which we call the Atlantean. The continents of Europe and Africa, in their present form, did not exist at that time, nor did the present form of America. In those days there was a primary continent on the earth known as Atlantis, a region occupying the present area of the Atlantic Ocean. You also know that at one point in the development of Atlantis, a particular kind of immorality became widespread across the civilized world of that time. People in those days were able to utilize natural forces to a much greater extent than was later the case. And over wide regions they exploited this capacity in an immoral manner. Looking back to these days, therefore, we can see it as an era of immorality. Then came the Atlantean catastrophe. A mainstream geologist will naturally attribute this catastrophe to mineral processes. One part of the ground sank lower, another was raised upward. Someone whose thinking embraces modern science will not for a moment imagine that what human beings did in any way contributed to the causes, but it did. In fact, the Atlantean catastrophe was the effect of what human beings did upon the planet. Besides merely external, mineral, natural causes of such great cataclysms that sweep over earthly existence, we must also seek causes that lie in human actions and activity. We human beings must be included as causative agents in the earth's existence. This is true not only of these great cataclysms, but also of things that continually occur. The actual connection between events of the cosmos that impact on the earth, thus earthly or telluric events, and what occurs within us human beings remains hidden initially. And in this context, our whole science is really nothing other than a great and all-embracing illusion. You see, if you wish to study the true causes of phenomena, you must delve further than external causes in the mineral, plant, or animal kingdom. I would like to illustrate this as follows. Let us, in a sense, approach what we are considering today from the opposite perspective. Here is the Earth's environment, which I will draw schematically, and there's a drawing, and this is the center of the Earth. If something occurs in the mineral, plant, or animal kingdom, we can seek the cause of it. I'll hint at the cause by saying that these points here are where the causes lie, again in the drawing. You can gain a sense of what I mean if you consider the following, if you go to Italy, to the region round Naples, 
you will find that the ground begins to smoke if you light a piece of paper. Simply lighting a piece of paper draws vapors from the earth. And then you can recognize that in the physical occurrence triggered by lighting a piece of paper lies something that draws up these vapors from below. In this case, by lighting the paper, you are thinning the air. That is the physical process. Because a thinner mass of air is created, the vapors in the earth are drawn upward. Otherwise, they are suppressed by the ordinary air pressure, which is lowered by lighting the piece of paper. If I wanted only to describe purely mineral phenomena of this kind, these vapors rising up from the earth, I could explain it thus. Here a piece of paper was lit. Here and here and so forth. See the points on the drawing. This is just illustrated schematically and shows that the cause of rising vapors does not lie below but above the earth. But now let these points A, B, C, D, and E, and F no longer represent lit pieces of paper, but something different, of which we are speaking today. Imagine firstly that these points have no intrinsic meaning, but rather that the whole system of points is significant. Do not picture lit pieces of paper anymore, but something else that I do not yet wish to tell you, though I will in a moment. Something else exists here as an active cause above the surface of the earth. And these differently working causes are not isolated from each other, but act together. And now, imagine that instead of only six points, there are, say, one and a half billion points, all working together in creating an overall effect. These one and a half billion points really do exist, for all of you have within you what one can call the center of gravity of your own physical person. This center of gravity is slightly higher in us when we're awake. It lies just beneath the diaphragm. When you're asleep, it lies slightly lower, but it is still there. So, there are one and a half billion centers of gravity across the globe, and these give rise to an overall effect, which is largely the cause of what occurs in the mineral, plant, and animal kingdoms of the earth. Thus the actions of air, water, and other mineral phenomena that you see around you can only be attributed to mineral causes if you pursue a mistaken science. In reality, their cause lies in the human interior. You see, this is a truth that hardly anyone has any inkling of today. Hardly anyone knows that processes occur in the mineral, plant, and animal kingdoms whose true cause actually lies within human organisms. This is not the cause of all the effects, but of a great proportion of them. Human beings, as they walk about upon the earth, bear within them the real cause of what occurs. And so we cannot properly study mineralogy, botany, or zoology without anthropology, without relating things to the human being. Science will tell you about chemical, physical, mechanical effects. But these have an intimate affinity with human will forces, which are, in fact, focused in our center of gravity. If you wish to get at the truth when speaking of the earth, instead of speaking of some kind of abstract earth as geologists do, you have to include the human being as part of the earth. These truths are revealed after crossing the threshold. Everything that we can know on this side of the threshold belongs really to cognitive illusions and not to the realm of true knowledge and perception. And now, we must ask this. What connection is there for humanity today, which is what we are talking about here initially, between human will forces concentrated at our center of gravity and external physical and chemical forces? 
In ordinary life, this relationship comes to expression only in human metabolic processes. When we assimilate the substances of the external world, it is actually our will that digests and processes them. And if it were only our will at work, then what we assimilate from without would merely decompose. The human will has the power to dissolve and decompose all other substances and forces. And the connection between the human being and the rest of mineral plant and animal nature is such today that our will is connected with the forces of dissolution of our planet, with the destructive forces of our planet. It is true that we live from this destruction, and yet that is what it actually is. We could not live if we did not bring about this destruction. We must keep this in mind. And the wrongful magical effects we have heard speak of arise largely from certain people learning to use their will in an unjustified way. In doing so, they do not keep destruction within the confines of human nature, but abnormally extend it beyond human boundaries, making conscious use of the forces of destruction rooted in the will. This is, of course, something that should never be taught. Through our will, we are certainly connected with the forces of degeneration of our planet Earth. And if as modern people we had nothing more than will forces, our earth would be destined for destruction through us, ourselves, through humanity. And then we would face a future on earth that would present a truly unedifying prospect. The earth would gradually dissolve and be scattered abroad through space. This is our nature in respect of one of the two poles. We are dual in nature. One part of our being is connected with the destructive forces of the planet, while the other, as mentioned, is the aspect of our intelligence. It is connected to the will via the bridge of sensibility and feeling. But this human intelligence relates very little to our earth as long as we are awake. During waking life, we are not really able to establish a proper relationship with earth existence through our intelligence. What I indicated here for the will is very much something that, although unconscious, occurs through human beings in waking existence. If you go for a walk and see an eroded cliff somewhere and wonder about the real causes of this erosion, you have to look inward into your organic nature. This sounds very paradoxical to people today, but it is so. And earth, as I said, would have a sad future if we did not have the other pole of our being, the upbuilding one. Just as the causes of all destruction lie in the human will, concentrated in turn at our center of gravity, so the upbuilding forces lie in the sphere that we enter during sleep. During sleep, our I, capital, and ca- astral body are in a condition we usually describe figuratively by saying that we are outside the physical body. But in this respect, we are very much a soul spiritual being, developing forces that come into play during sleep. And while we sleep, These forces connect us to everything that has an upbuilding, synthesizing effect on the planet Earth, counteracting destructive forces with upbuilding ones. If you never walked about on the Earth, the destructive forces that really issue from your will would never act within the mineral, plant, and animal kingdoms on the Earth. And if you never slept on Earth, what continually restores and builds the earth up again would never issue from your intelligence. The forces that actually build up our planet Earth 
also lie within human beings themselves. I am not saying they lie within the individual. Earlier, I expressly said how these diverse causes are connected. But the forces of restoration and synthesis also lie within all humanity, at the pole of human intelligence, though not in waking intelligence. The intelligence of waking life is like a dead element intervening in earth evolution, whereas the human intelligence that acts unconsciously during sleep is what continually builds up planet earth. What I am trying to make clear is the error of seeking the destructive and upbuilding forces of our planet outside of the human being. They must be sought instead within us. If you take proper account of this, you will not regard what I will now say as incomprehensible. When you look at, up at the stars, you recognize that certain effects issue from them which human sense organs here on earth can perceive. But what you gaze up into when you look at the stars is not identical in nature with what you observe when you look at the mineral plant and animal kingdoms on earth. Rather, it issues from the intelligence and will of beings whose life is connected with the stars. The stars only look like something physical because they are at a great distance, but they are not. They are constituted of what is occurring in the beings of will and intelligence there. I said to you on a previous occasion that astrophysicists present a very fine, very neat account of our sun. But if someone were to travel to the sun in some Jules Verne type machine, he would be astonished to discover nothing like our physical descriptions suggest he should. It is only here, in our earthly existence, that it appears so to us, as combined effect of what the sun reveals. In reality, what we see here is the action of will and intelligence, which appears to us as light at the distance we are from it. And if there were such a thing in this sense, a moon inhabitant observing the earth would not observe there the grasslands, the mineral expanses, but, albeit also as light effects and similar, he would perceive what occurs around the center of gravity of human bodies and what occurs as the effect of our sleeping state. What happens when we are in the condition of sleep? That is really what would be seen from far off. The chairs we are sitting on here could not be seen from that distance, however perfect an instrument was used. But what happens around your center of gravity and what would happen if all of you fell asleep, hopefully you don't all fall asleep on these occasions, only a few of you, is what would be perceived from outside the earth. Thus, in respect of the external cosmos, what happens through humankind here on earth is the visible thing is the important thing, and not what we see here around us. The idea that everything which our external senses perceive is maya, a great illusion, mere phenomena, has become current today and is often reiterated. Such an abstract idea is of little value, really. It only acquires value if we go into specific detail, as we have just done here. There is no value in saying that the animal, plant, and mineral kingdoms are maya. But it is worth recognizing that your outward perceptions are basically dependent on yourself, and that, not at every moment, but in overall terms as humanity, you yourself are interwoven with the tissue of cause and effect. But even if a shocking truth such as this, for I think it might seem shocking, is expressed as a deeper truth of nature, it still does not yet acquire the aspect that is really of special significance for human life. Such a truth only becomes important if we draw a certain conclusion from it. We really are not just physical human beings here on earth, or just outwardly sense perceptible human beings. 
Here on earth we are moral beings, or immoral ones. What we do is determined by moral impulses. And now reflect on the fact that our modern worldview casts the gravest doubt on such an idea, that science offers knowledge of earthly things which is entirely subsumed within purely external natural causes and natural effects. And into this chain of purely natural causes and effects we are to place the human being too. That is what external abstract science tells us. It reckons only with one dimension of earthly existence. And then people become aware that moral impulses also dawn in human beings, but they cannot work out what connection there is between these moral impulses and what happens outside them in nature. This is the crux, the cross of modern philosophy. On the one hand, philosophers learn from scientists that everything is embedded in natural causes and effects, while on the other hand it is apparent that human beings have moral impulses. For this reason Kant wrote two critiques, his title Critique of Pure Reason, which concerns how human beings relate to purely natural matters, and the title Critique of Practical Reason, in which he establishes his moral postulates, which, to put it metaphorically, hover in the air, really, coming from somewhere or other, and having no connection with natural causes. You see, as long as people believe that external natural phenomena can only be attributed to other such phenomena, as long as we thus succumb to maya, moral impulses can only be seen as something running parallel to and unconnected with the life of nature. Almost everything people say today suffers from this split and duality, or lives in its shadow. They are unable to reconcile earthly reality as such with moral impulses in humanity. But as soon as you know things such as those I briefly tried to outline today, you can see that your human nature is a unity and moral impulses live in you. Your moral impulses live in unified accord with your physical nature. But as a physical human being, I am basically the cause, naturally along with the rest of humanity, of everything that also physically occurs. And then what human beings accomplish morally upon earth is seen as the real cause of what unfolds in the world. As human beings on earth, we have our natural history, our science, with accounts of physics, geology, botany, and so on. These accounts initially satisfy people, confirming for them what their education has taught them. But let us imagine a Martian arriving on earth and observing things with his own predisposition. Having, after a while, learned a human language, he might read a human textbook on geology and begin to see what earthlings think about processes and occurrences on earth. And then he might very well object and say that this view does not include the most important thing of all. He will say that he has, for instance, seen lots of students hanging around in bars and drinking, indulging themselves, and that as they do this, something is continually occurring. The human will interacts with the metabolism to produce occurrences that are missing from geology and physics textbooks. The Martian might well object that these books say nothing about the fact that earthly phenomena also depend on whether such students drink or not. Someone not entirely persuaded by mundane ideas of the kind living in modern preconceptions would find this aspect lacking in accounts which human beings themselves write of earthly conditions. Our hypothetical Martian would have no doubt at all that the moral impulses active in all human deeds and human life are part and parcel of the life of the natural world. In modern preconceptions, the natural order has an extremely compelling quality, which may even seem unpleasantly intrusive to some, especially if they are materialistic thinkers. 
they believed that the natural world would be the same without human beings. They think, therefore, that whether I am a decent person or a rogue makes no particular difference to the world. It does not impact on the natural order. But this is not so. Causative factors in the natural world do not lie outside human beings. The most important earthly occurrences are caused by factors that lie not outside but within humanity. And if global consciousness is to arise in people as a further development of merely earthly consciousness, humanity will have to recognize that it shapes the earth in its own image, not in short periods but over great spans of time. The best way of keeping humanity in comfortable slumber is to persuade people they have no part in the course of Earth's development, so that human responsibility is confined and limited to the human individual alone, to an individual human person. But in truth, humanity is responsible for what the Earth undergoes in cosmic ages, and one only feels oneself to be a real earthly human being by conceiving of the Earth as the body of the whole of humanity dwelling upon it. This means having a feeling resembling that of an individual who recognizes that pursuit of his passions over a ten-year period has ruined his body. Means recognizing that if earthly humanity lives in impulses of an impure moral nature, the body of the earth will become different from what it will do if we live in purely moral impulses. The mayfly, which lives for only a day, naturally has a different outlook from human beings. But human beings fail to recognize that what outwardly unfolds in the natural world is not dependent on merely natural causes. Far more important than inquiring into the modern shape of Europe or studying the external mineral botanical structure of the earth two millennia ago is to ask this. How did people live here two millennia ago? Or how did they live then anywhere within human civilization? The fate of the earth in two millennia will not depend on the nature of our present mineral world, but on what we ourselves do or fail to do. With cosmic consciousness, human responsibility expands to become world responsibility. When we look up to the starry skies with the kind of awareness I have described to you, we feel a sense of responsibility toward the cosmic realms through which spirit swells and surges. We feel responsible to this realm for how we fashion the earth in accordance with it. This is part and parcel of something I often reiterate. We must learn to look at things that are nowadays largely conveyed in the abstract instead as tangible realities. We gain little from adopting oriental terms such as maya and saying that the outer world of the senses is illusion. We have to go deeper to reach the truth. Such abstractions do not get us very far for in the way they have reached us they are nothing more than the relics of a primordial wisdom which itself did not live in abstractions but in detailed realities such as those that intuitive spiritual research must now draw forth again. Please do not believe that when you read about Maya in Oriental texts and the reality of which it is only a reflection that you can truly understand this. This is only a kind of summary of things that were known tangibly in primordial wisdom and were then compiled and condensed in more general terms. We need to return to tangible realities. People often think they understand something of cosmic processes when they say things such as that, quote, the external sense world is maya, close quote. We can only truly understand something by penetrating to detailed realities. 
The moment you realize that the mineral world is not simply the outcome of the mineral world of a different epoch, but the result of processes that unfold within human beings themselves, then you recognize also what it means to see only maya in the outer world. And then you begin to see a far more intense reality in the human being than you ordinarily do. At that point, a great sense of responsibility begins toward all existence. If you try to comprehend these things inwardly, for they can only be perceived with inner vision, not with the ordinary external mode of intelligence based on the model of modern science, you will gradually begin to understand, too, that humanity is composed of free human beings. Nature does not actually contradict our freedom. That is because, as human beings, we create the natural world that so closely surrounds us. Nature only counters our freedom in partial phenomena. Its opposition to our freedom is no greater than when, to speak metaphorically, you extend a hand and another person takes hold of it and restrains it. Because someone else restrains one of your movements does not mean, of course, that you have no free will. As modern human beings, we are also constrained in various ways by the fact that people in prehistoric times did something whose effects only come to expression today. But it was people who did this. What kind of people? Well, not the kind we can easily reproach, since it was we ourselves in previous lives who created the conditions in which we now live. We must not limit ourselves to speaking only of recurring lives on earth, but also conceive of the whole context in which effects in the outer world have been caused by ourselves in past lives. We must also remember, however, that we are not speaking individually here. All of us together on earth helped create the causes, as I have said before. No one, therefore, should exclude themselves from the picture for all are part of what the whole of humanity brings about and what then comes to expression in the earth as the outwardly describable body of the ongoing life of humanity. Thus I wanted to give you an idea of how the spiritual scientist must regard what is described in the accounts of external science. This really isn't much different from something I will depict in this series of forms and as a drawing, assume that some kind of being crawled out of the ground that had never lived in the human world, that it saw these shapes and, let us say, it had a knowledge of arithmetic, described them as first shape, second shape, third shape. The third is the effect of the second, the second the effect of the first. The first has the effect triangle, the second has the effect circle. This being that had crawled out of the ground would summarize cause and effect in this way. Readers aside, the three figures left to right are a triangle, uh, thin and standing, uh, equilateral triangle after that, and then a circle. End of readers aside. But this isn't so, for I drew one shape after another, and in reality they are quite independent of each other. It would only appear so to this putative being whose preconception is that the one is the effect of the other. And this is roughly how the modern geologist describes the evolution of the earth. What emerges, say, in the diluvial period, the tertiary, the alluvial, and so forth. But these things do not dictate each other, just as little as this circle is the effect of the triangle and the triangle of the rectangle. They are independent of each other, just set alongside each other. And in precisely the same way, the deeds of human beings on earth have brought about earth existence, albeit including what humanity accomplishes in sleep through the mysterious workings of intelligence, which likewise has effects when we are, as it were, outside the body. So you can see that what is externally described by our supposed science is very largely mere illusion, maya. 
But simply speaking the word Maya is not enough. This critical verdict that the external world is only Maya must be extended by recognizing where the true causes lie, causes that are, however, hidden. Exoteric human knowledge finds it very hard to reveal them. Outer knowledge cannot ascertain the degree to which humanity itself develops the conditions of earth existence, something we can only discern by progressing from outer to inner knowledge. As you can see from my book titled Knowledge of the Higher Worlds, it is possible to know what we do between falling asleep and awakening. We can investigate it through a mode of knowledge that delves down as far as the will. The way in which the will is connected with the outer world, you see, is hidden from people, since the will process is hidden from human perception. The human being does not know what it signifies when he lifts his hand at any moment, when he enacts a process of will. He does not know that this will process perpetuates itself and signifies something for the whole of earth's continuance. This is what I meant when I wrote the scene entitled The Portal of Initiation, in which I have Capacius and Strader do all kinds of things that then continue in cosmic occurrences, in thunder and lightning. Naturally, this is pictorially presented, but such pictures signify a deeper truth. It is not mere fantasy, but points to a real truth. For a fairly long time now in human evolution, such truths have really only been uttered by true poets whose imaginative capacities are always connected with supersensible occurrences. People today have little understanding of this. They regard poetry, art altogether, as something invented, something set down alongside external reality. It is a great relief for them if they don't have to think of poetry as anything more meaningful than arbitrary invention. True poetry, true art, though, is a reflection of supersensible truth, albeit only a reflection. Even if the poet, if he has not freed himself from his merely materialistic education, may be unaware of the supersensible occurrences unfolding when his soul is tuned to the cosmos. He may still utter truths that are certainly supersensible in nature, even if compelled to do so through pictures drawn from sense existence. Many such things are to be found in Part 2 of Goethe's title, Faust. There, as I have shown in specific instances, the truths presented in images can certainly be related to supersensible processes. In relation to the history of art in recent eras, we can even corroborate this. If you look at a painting from an era of art history not so far back in the past, you will find that the artist gives very secondary importance to the landscape. Only in the last three, four, or five centuries does landscape really begin to figure in painting and is accorded its own due. If you look further back in art history, you will find the landscape to be very much secondary to the human world since in those days people were still mindful of the fact that the world of human beings was of far greater importance for objective realities than the landscape. The landscape is actually only an effect of the human world. Precisely in the rise of a predilection for landscape we find in art something that runs parallel to the rise of the materialistic outlook which consists only in the belief that what is distinct and separate from the human being has its own intrinsic validity. But it does not. It has no distinct and separate validity. A Martian who came here would easily find meaning in Leonardo's title Last Supper, but not in landscape paintings as such. He would see them quite differently anyway because of his different sense organs and would also regard the whole configuration of earth differently. I only offer this as a metaphor to characterize what I am getting at here. You can see from this that the phrase about the outer world being Maya 
can only be fully comprehended if we consider detailed realities. And to do so we have to include ourselves as human beings in the totality of earth existence. And then we must even accustom ourselves to think that there can be realities, outward realities, seeming realities, which are not, in fact, realities. If you have a rose in your room, it is a seeming reality only. A rose as it stands there before you cannot exist. It can only exist when joined to its roots on the rose bush, and when these in turn are joined with the earth. Equally, what the geologist describes as earth cannot exist as such. To true discernment, it is just as much an untrue reality as the rose is. Spiritual science seeks never to make do with untrue reality, but always to seek what must be added to it to create a whole, a whole true reality. The unreal meaning of modern civilization expresses itself in the fact that people regard everything that manifests outwardly as a reality. But reality can only exist in something intrinsically whole. To regard the earth itself as distinct from the human beings who dwell there is no more a reality than a rose that has been cut from the rose bush. Look, these things have to be pondered and assimilated. They must not remain theoretical only, but must become part of our sensibility and outlook. We must feel ourselves to be a part of the whole earth. And it is important that we keep telling ourselves that this finger here that has grown on my hand only remains a reality while it belongs to my organism. If I cut it off, it is no longer its true reality. Nor is the human being a true reality if sundered from the earth. Nor is the earth a true reality if sundered from humankind. To think, as scientists do today, that Earth would evolve in the same way if humanity did not exist is an unreal thought. That it would not evolve like this I explained to you a little while ago from a different angle when I showed that the bodies people shed at death form an ingredient in the evolving earth that is as necessary as the ferment in a loaf. And that if no further human bodies became one with the earth the whole physical process of Earth's evolution would also be different from what it is when these bodies, irrespective of whether they are buried or cremated, are consigned to the Earth. Today I wanted to describe, more precisely for once, the connection existing between the poles of human will and intelligence and the surrounding cosmos.